If you will, turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 2. Continuing in our contemplation of the apostles' objectives and goal for us. There we go. Bring it down just a tad more. Da 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 da. That ought to work. You should have an outline as well available for you guys, a threefold building process wherein we have been actually going deep into the apostles' gesture in commending the church to God and led us to the book of Ephesians wherein I want to work with you tonight on some of the language there as well. So you're going to have your hands at Acts chapter 20 as well as Ephesians 3. And we'll build further from there. In fact, what I'm going to do is erase this board now. You guys know there will be no study next week um, for the Friday night study or for the Saturday night men's meeting. Just to let you know, we'll reaffirm this on Sunday. The note there, um, Daughters of Grace, that's G-O-D backwards, <clears throat> um, will take place tomorrow. Just to let you know, if um, you aren't doing anything, you should join us then. It's going to be a great class. What we will be dealing with tomorrow in our DOG, Daughters of Grace um, presentation and series, is addressing the importance of... Uh, Appreciating your space as a woman, understanding what it means to um, determine whether or not you're going to allow someone into your space based upon you permitting them to because you are clear on who you are and you actually have real specific and concrete tools by which you stop someone from actually proceeding further into your space than you want. And that actually deals with the psychological, it deals with the emotional, and then it deals with the practical. And so tomorrow's class is around defending yourself against intruders, which is something that is really important for women, wouldn't you say? It's true for men too, but it's really true for our sisters. And there's probably two areas in which that kind of class will be so beneficial. One, on the part of our sisters, Uh, developing a strong enough internal characteristic that says they know who they are and whose they are so that they are not ambivalent about who gets to enter into their space. And when people do transgress and enter into their space, they know how to deal with it. If our daughters had been taught that many years ago, there would have been a lot of things that they would have been able to avoid. The other part of learning that for your daughters is that an individual who has no respect for women will cross the line. And they will quickly cross the line with women who don't either have respect for themselves or don't know how to speak vocally enough to tell a man when to stop. And this is something all of our daughters need to know at the earliest age. So, you may think that this class is not for you. You would be selfish. And as a consequence, when we're selfish, we lose out on the blessings of God. And if you are selfish in that regard, then you're not mature because maturity cares about others even when you have everything together in your life. I would that the whole building would be filled up with women tomorrow who are willing to learn what it means to be created in the Imago Dei as God's image bearer and therefore God's property. And no one gets to touch God's property unless you give them permission to do so. So we're going to open in a word of prayer. Then I want to just take you into our continued analysis of Paul's objective to commend the church at Ephesus to God as it's given to us in Ephesians chapter 3. Let's pray. So Father, we thank you for this season. We thank you for your word. We thank you for this opportunity now to gather around your word and by your spirit, and we need your grace for it. We ask that you would settle our hearts and our minds down now, 
and that you would do for us what we cannot do for ourselves, open our understanding, open our, open our comprehension to the realities of your grace and your purpose which you have ordained for us in Christ before the foundation of the world. Help us to enter into those blessings, draw from those blessings what is necessary to build us up and to give us what Paul plainly said was ours in Christ, an inheritance among all those that are sanctified in Christ Jesus. Help us understand the far-reaching implications of going as deep and as intimate and as serious with you as a human being possibly can by the grace of God. So we acknowledge our sinfulness, we acknowledge our weakness, we acknowledge our vacillating state, we acknowledge our unqualified state, we acknowledge that in every area of life, apart from your grace, we can achieve nothing. And we pray this for ourselves and for the body of Christ all over the world. We need you. And we ask now for traveling mercies for those that are yet coming, ask for distractions to be removed from everybody's mind. We may have some brothers and sisters here that are really going through it. Show up in their life, oh Lord, to settle them down so that they can actually take a walk with you through the word of God tonight without being distracted. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. All right, so Acts chapter 20, let's look quickly again at verse 32, and I'm gonna take you back to Ephesians chapter three, and I'm just gonna talk with you through where the Lord has taken me in the study of the promise that is given to us here in Acts 30, uh, Acts 20, verse 32. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is what we're working through in Ephesians chapter 3. Which word of his grace is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all them which are what? Right. So what we have in verse 32, part C, is a promise. The word of his grace is able to do something for you. It's able to build you up. That's part one. And then to give you an inheritance among all them that are sanctified. That's part two. The promise is the word of his grace is able to do something for you and in you that you can't do for yourself. And it's also able to put you in the category of all those who obtain the inheritance of eternal life because they have been sanctified in Christ Jesus. That's a big mouthful to chew on and to think through and to work through, but this is where we have begun to engage in Ephesians chapter 3. I'll just state this for those of you who are visiting with us. We are juggling Acts chapter 20 because Acts chapter 20 has given us the origin, history, and final sort of closing relationship between Paul and the church at Ephesus. And we are now contemplating the book of Ephesians chapter 3 as the text that explains for us what Paul meant when he said what he said in this verse. So we are holding together, not in tension, but collaboratively what is declared and what is expounded. So I want you now to go with me in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 3. And let's begin to work through the proposition that Paul lays out in terms of his request and objective for the church at Ephesus. Since he has laid them at the door of God, that's what we mean by commending, since he has placed the whole church at the steps of God, and he is confident that God is able to do for them what they cannot do for themselves, he now is yielding in Ephesians 3 the letter that he wrote to them what his desires and aspirations are for them along these same lines of God building them up. And we've talked about building up. We talked about strengthening. We talked about God developing them. We talked about the whole Orchidemeo concept of the believer being built up a spiritual house in the Lord and how God has to do that. I want you to go with me back to verse uh, 17, and we're going to be working verses 17 through 19. And they're going to be a mouthful, but I want to kind of run back through what we started with last week, and then hopefully we can get into verse 18 and 19. So Paul is in the middle of six glorious chapters given to the church at Ephesus. The first two chapters, as it were, establishing a grand theological framework for them having been chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world, them being called by his grace through the gospel, adopted in the beloved, and then for therefore called by the Spirit of God to enter into the riches of Christ's grace, which is part of what he's talking about in Ephesians, in rather Acts chapter 2, that they would be built up so that they would obtain an inheritance being sanctified 
among all those, being uh, put among all those that are sanctified. And Paul in chapter 3, after having said so much about the grace of God, begins to actually explain to them what he desires for them. So what he desires for them, in essence, is what might be called a prayer. And this prayer is really what I think was partially expostulated in Acts chapter 20, where he kneels and prays before he leaves. So I want you to see how this works. What a man says who really knows God to God about a people that he really wants to know God. What a man says to God who really knows God about a people that he wants to really know God. So in verse 16, it says that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. This is Paul's opening desire for the church at Ephesus, that God would grant unto you. Notice what he's asking God to do. The word grant actually literally means to enable or to depart unto you with the objective of enabling you. The Greek term do there simply means to make it possible for you avail you to what is necessary to achieve a certain goal. And I like the way the translators translated it, grant, because that's what a grant is. A grant makes possible something that is impossible on the part of the person that needs the grant. It's almost like a gift, but it's more than a gift. It's something that somebody made available so that that individual can transition from where they are to where they need to be on the grounds of a grant. And if that's true, in reality, the totality of our salvation is a grant. And so the idea of a grant is somebody really being auspicious and favorable to you because you can't pay what's necessary to move you from position A to position B. And so this is what Paul is saying that he's praying to God. And it's in what we call a subjective verb form. And what that means is he's praying that this would be possible for you. He's not making the assumption that it is. He's saying, I'm praying that this would be possible for you. He's not asserting that he knows this will occur. And so therefore, on the part of those that are listening, the heart should say, yes, Lord, may this be so for me too. In all humility, I want all that God wants for me. And so this is what he means by he prays that God would grant unto them. And then remember we talked about grant unto them according to the what? Riches of his glory. So now the content or the substance or the wealth and resources of God are described as the riches of his glory, which is a term Paul uses all throughout the New Testament, that God would reach into the riches of his glory and give those that Paul is praying for what they need in order for them to experience what's about to fall out in the latter verses. If God has to reach into the riches of his glory, in order to accomplish this for us, what, to, what is to be accomplished must be very important. If God must reach into the riches of his glory to give you what is necessary to accomplish what we are about to talk about, what is to be accomplished must be exceedingly important to be the effect of him reaching into the riches of his glory. You guys with me? Now, if you're honest as an expository listener, even the few things that I've just stated really are high and lofty terms that on an intellectual level really require being careful and thoughtful about examining what does God mean? What does the word of God mean when it says reaching down into the riches of his glory? That's lofty language, isn't it? That's language that really requires us to humble ourselves and say, Lord, what do you mean by the riches of your glory? Can you translate that into something a little bit more practical? Well, yes and no. Yes and no. If you want to write a word down that is going to be kind of a, a support basis for what we're talking about, it's the word mystery. It's the word mystery. You can write it down. The Greek term mysterion is a New Testament uh, terminology that is used by the Lord Jesus and the apostles to describe the nature of the kingdom of God. The nature of the kingdom is a mystery. The nature of the kingdom of God is that it's a what? A mystery. Now, a mystery is something that we can know in part, but never know fully. 
And so really what Paul is talking to us about is a mystery, but it's not a mystery that is so veiled that we know nothing about it. Let me see if I can help you as I pour into this, if you don't mind. Everything in your life is a mystery to one degree or another. Everything. There is nothing that you and I know about anything of any real substance that we can plumb the depths of and know it in totality. Especially those things that God made. If God made it, we can know it enough for it to have functional benefit for us, but we never know it in the plummet of its depths because it has its origins in a God who himself is a mystery. One of the reasons why the believer has to have a healthy dose of humility when it comes to God is because there is an insignia of mystery that is associated with everything there is to know about God. God's own nature is a mystery to you. There are people that will be offended with you because you simply say that God is. And then when they say, show me, and you say, well, you know what? That's mighty hard to do. Why? Because in a sense, God's a mystery. If in fact we declare God to be spirit, then we've got a lot of work to do to deal with nomenclature and terminology and phraseology around the panuma or the ruah in the Hebrew, and that is the spirit of God. What is that? Is it a ghost? Is it a phantom? Is it some type of ethereal sort of uh, vaporish entity? Now we have to argue about the invisibility of God, don't we? And the, the, the uh, agnostic and the atheist constantly barrage us with arguments that we don't have sufficient evidence of God's existence. What we say is you are failing to realize that at the fundamental level of who God is, there is a mystery. That if you are not willing to acquiesce to that mystical connotation of the being of God, you can never really know him in any saving way until you meet him on the last day. But then they will, he and ha about, well, see, you really just don't have enough evidence. I say, have you ever seen electricity? Or have you ever seen gravity? Or have you ever seen the dynamics of G-force or what we call, you know, the, the, the law of, of inertia? No, you've only seen the outcome, the impact, the consequence of it, because it's a mystery. Do you really comprehend what we would say is the parallel world and universe of those who get into higher math and quantum physics, et cetera, et cetera, who have to work with theory in order to get a handle on some of these things? You guys understand what I'm saying? It's all mystery, isn't it? Can you really tell a person why it is that the sperm and the ovum connect and a life, boom, takes place? Sometimes, and not all the time. Can you explain why that happens? That's a mystery, isn't it? A whole lot of things are so fundamentally mysterious to us that when we say we know a whole lot in reality, we don't know much at all about anything. Can you really explain what it means for God to be both divine and human at the same time, the hypostatic union of the God, man, Jesus earth? Really? Can you really explain that? Can you really explain that? Can you really explain a perfect human being, impeccable in his nature, impeccable in his conduct, impeccable in all that he does, and now he serves as a mediator between God and man? Can you explain that? Really? Can you explain what it means to be born again? Can you explain how God can raise you from the dead spiritually, give you life and faith in Christ, illuminate your mind and your understanding, cause you to love God when you hated God before, draw near to God when you ran from God before? One day you ran, the next day you run into him. One day you swore there was no God, the next day you can hear God all over the place. Can you explain that? Isn't that a mystery? The opening of the blind eyes and the deaf ear is a mystery, isn't it? Healing is a mystery in the medical industry. They, a humble doctor will quickly tell you, you know what, I got a PhD, but I really don't know much. It's called wisdom. So what Paul is talking about that he's sharing with us in the context of us wanting to be a participant in this gradual development of sanctification and growth in Christ is largely a what? A mystery. Look at how chapter 3 opens up. I'm going to start back at verse 8 
and 9 and 10. You'll see it in verse t uh, 9. Are you there? Unto me who am less than the least of all saints is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Here's an adjective that blows my mind. Paul uses this term unsearchable several times. You know what he knows about that? He knows that the nature and character of Christ and all that he is is unsearchable. That is a curiosity for me because sometimes we don't know that. And we need to know that he's unsearchable. So Paul has had some experience somewhere, hasn't he? That concretely affirmed to him that the riches of Christ that we can know are unsearchable. And I, I want to take you there as we go through our text to show you that what God will do for you and me who are really wanting to walk with him is show us an aspect of his infinitude that we can describe as unsearchable, but it can only be declared by those who have actually come to know it. That's par paradoxical. That's paradoxical. God's riches in Christ are unsearchable. Well, how do you know that? You guys understand what I'm saying? So you're being, you're being made to make a convicting statement about something that really cannot be fully explored because if it's unsearchable, not to say that it cannot be experienced, but it cannot be fathomed, that truth had to be revealed to you. You couldn't have come up with that on your own. Your capacity for knowing anything has no ability for unsearchable things. So for you to know that Christ is unsearchable in the wealth and the riches of his being, guess what? God had to tell you that. You got that? I'm going to show you something as we're working through the word, and this is very important. Will God tell us things that, apart from him telling us, we could never know? Will God tell us things apart from which, if he doesn't tell us, we could perish? And in God telling us those things that, apart from him telling us, we could never know, but he tells us in order for us to benefit from the fact that we could never know, I'm not playing with words. Actually, what I am doing is helping ground you a little bit more into an appreciation of the nature of God and his word that's going to help you and I stay sober when it comes to pursuing God. Does that make some sense? Yeah. Right. So we can talk about things we don't know so long as we know those things. They may come off as paradoxical and nonsensical, but the fact of the matter is, this is the life of the people of God everywhere. Now watch this. Here's what it says. Unto me, who am least of all the saints, is this grace given that I should preach, the, uh, preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the what? Make all men to see what is the fellowship of the mystery. That's paradoxical and oxymoronic too. How can you see a mystery? Well, it has to be made known to you. And it has to be made known to you that it is a mystery. So here's what Paul says his job is to go around declaring a mystery to people that they can never fully comprehend, but they better get something of it if they're going to be saved. For those of you who can only handle five minute sound bites, the mystery that he's talking about is called the gospel. You can write that down. It's the gospel of the glory of God in Christ, which qualifies hellbound sinners to be a partaker of the divine nature at such a level that we get to enter into the riches of Christ and enjoy things that we can never fully know but we must know in part in order to know him, which according to the word of God, John 17, 3, is eternal life. One of the things I want to do today is once again raise the value of biblical knowledge in your thinking. And show you how, an important, how important it is for you as a Christian to take this journey with God into the depths of his gospel so that you can see things and know things that are essential for you to make it through this crazy world. 
Because where men and women are having to navigate life without the riches of his grace, which are plainly laid out in his word for those who are granted the ability to walk with God, life is a mess. It's a mess. Notice what he says, in order for men to see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God who created all things by Jesus Christ. There go fighting words all over the place right there. Those are all fighting words. And yet, you know what he just stated? He says, God created everything by Jesus Christ and God wants you to understand the fellowship of that mystery. That's the other word I want you to get. Because when we go to verses 15 through 17, what he's going to explain to you and me is this. The deep, profound, increasing, growing knowledge of who God is and the depths of his revelatory essence is only accomplished by God in us collectively. It's only accomplished by God in us collectively. Are you with me? Show you something. So like right now, God in his providence and his sovereignty has determined before the world began that at 843 on this Friday evening, a group of people is sitting and hearing the unsearchable riches of Christ communicated to them of which their lives will be the better for it if they go through this exercise until the class is over. They will know me better than they knew me before they came in simply because of this exercise. This is something that God has purposed and determined from the beginning of the world to the end of the world by which his people everywhere who call upon his name would know him. It's called the fellowship of the mystery. You guys got that? The fellowship of it. The importance of the aggregate gathering of the people of God in the presence of God under the word of God by the spirit of God bringing us into the realities of the riches of God at the level of which the consequence thereof for those who receive it is a greater sanctification because of a greater knowledge and therefore a greater impact on their life. Whenever we meet God in his word, we are the better for it no matter whether it hurts or not. So watch this. He's already given us our word mystery. So now I've told you that the framework and the premise upon which his prayer is rooted is a mystery. So as you are walking with me through verses 16, 17, and 18, and I'm only going to be able to 19 as well, I'm only going to talk to you about some of the verbs there to, to show you how important the process is of this thing that he desires for us. Don't be mad if you don't understand everything. Be desperate enough to say, God, show me, so that in order for you to get it later, just because you don't get it today don't mean you won't get it. Okay, so, so work with me on this now. All right, going back to verse 16. We stated that, that Paul says, Lord, I am praying that you would grant unto them according to the riches of your glory, according to the riches of your glory. Glory in this context will be the full measure of God's resources and being, according to the full measure of your resource and being, of your being and resource, because God by nature is glorious and everything that God possesses is glorious. Therefore, he is called the God of what? Glory, both in the old and the new. And then he says, to be strengthened with might. So the first thing that you and I want to understand is that God is going to reach into his wealth and resource of riches first and foremost to do what? Strengthen us. You got it? To strengthen us. Now, that term strengthen there uh, means to be made mighty. It means to be made mighty. Now, don't let this go to your head. But it means to be made mighty. And it ought not to surprise you that God desires and pursues the making of his people mighty. Because his people are his family. And if you are a family member of God, because God himself by nature is almighty, 
than the family members possessing the participation in the divine nature are going to be able to experience that fruit and that consequent of his glory in order for them to understand the things that God wants them to understand, you have to be made mighty too. Am I making some sense? So the term strengthen there is where we actually took up last week from the whole concept of the oikel demeo or the building up, right? Remember we talked about that? That God's purpose is to uh, build us up. Well, when you are built up, you are made what? That's right. We all start off weak. And as we grow, we build, we develop, and we become strong. So what I love about theology is the coherence of it. Paul is using a term that he's going to use in chapter 6 when he says, be strong in the Lord. Well, here he's saying, Lord, make them strong. So he's not saying something that's outrageous. What he's saying is, God's purpose for his believer is to be made to be strong for a purpose. So right now you have to look at yourself as a spiritual atlas or Arnold Schwarzenegger or nothing. I, you know, forget it. But understand that this might comes from another place, and that is an um, application, as we stated last week, of power. An application of power. So will you notice the way that Paul uses the term? That you might be strengthened with what? All might. Do you guys see that? Is that what your Bible says? Right. So it says here, we're praying that God would strengthen you, that you would be strengthened with all might. So the literal construction is this. And it's in what we call the passive verb form, which means somebody is doing something for you. You're not doing it. For you to be strengthened is not for you to make yourself strong. For you to be strengthened is for somebody to shore you up, build you up, qualify, instill within you all of the necessary characteristics and traits for you to become strong. So this is a passive work on the part of the believer. It's a dynamic work on the part of God. Are y'all with me? But I, I just want you to get the sort of subtle terminology that Paul uses all the time. Two words he uses all the time in the Greek, kratos, 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 and that is to be made strong or to be made mighty. And the other word that he uses is the word power, from which we get the term dynamite rooted in the Greek word dunamas. Dunamas. Literally in the Greek, this is the way it would be constructed. I am praying that God would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, that by his power you would be made strong or mighty. So really the primary mechanism or instrumental means of your strengthening is the might, which should be translated power. And that would be my argument with my King James brothers if I was sitting at the table with them. Why do you constantly use different words at different times when it's one Greek word, which would be much better if you maintain some consistency? But that's okay. We're not going to argue with them. The Bible says it's for the purpose of kings to search out the matter, to labor and to see those, those inconsistencies on the surface and find out what's going on behind it. The point is, is that God's saying, Paul is saying that he's praying that God would reach down into the riches of his glory in order to strengthen the Ephesians with a power that has to be applied by his spirit. Do you see it? So notice again, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with all might by what? By his spirit. All right, here's the next thing I want you to capture. I want you to capture that God in the provisions of grace for those are, who are believers has given us the third person, which is the spirit of the living God, which is the resident Lord in our life to be our coach to employ the necessary means of strengthening so that we become strong. The essential means is the Spirit of God. The is instrumental means is that power we talked about. And the outcome is being strengthened. Are you guys following me? The essential means is the third person. That's that person that gets in your face. More push-ups! I can't! Take this! What is this? The gospel. 
What do you mean by the gospel? The power of God. That you are to constantly take until it works in you a transformative effect so that you become strong. Are you watching? Are you, are you hearing me? Right. So the spirit of God has been given to us out of the riches of his glory. Go hang out with that one and 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 walk with them and help them and talk with them and educate them and strengthen them and give them what is necessary to build them up. Oh, by the way, make sure it's the gospel. Because the gospel alone is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believes from beginning to end. Are you guys hearing what I'm saying? Now, so if, if the gospel is that, then we, we have a really good idea, if we're believers, what the contents of that power base is. What the content of that power base is. Not just the impact, but the content of that power base. For those of us who know the gospel, for us, the gospel is always the person and work of Jesus Christ. Always. So what is the third person doing? He's taking the second person and making you strong according to the will of the first person. The first person wants you to enjoy fellowship with him as a son, and therefore he sends the third person to communicate the second person to you in order that you might become like the second person since you are in relationship through the second person to the first person. Did y'all get that? Did you get that? Right, so I'm, I'm, I'm shrinking it down to a simple concept that really is given to us in verse 15, a subtle hint, just in case you guys are struggling. The goal of Father God is to have many sons and daughters. And the only way they're going to become sons and daughters is by a deep and profound transformative union between them and the son by the efficacy and work of the third person. Is that true? How am I going to become a son of God except by union with Christ? How am I going to have union with Christ except the Spirit of God bring Christ and make him a reality in my life? Are you guys, who here is following me? Raise your hand if you're following me. If you're following me, then watch this. If you're following me, watch this. Then you know I have broken it down to the simple gospel, haven't I? The simple gospel is God the Father so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes on him should not perish but have what? Everlasting life. What is everlasting life? It's God. It's God. That's John 17, 3. You see how it all revolves and returns back again to the simple gospel? But the simple gospel, as I said to you last week, is like a wonderful present that has to be unpacked. Don't just give me a present and expect me not to pull that ball, pop that lid up, and go in and see the goods. And that's what God is calling us to do. So now watch the next statement that he makes around this, which is really interesting. He says in verse 16, that, you would, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with all might by his spirit in the inner man. So now we have to deal with another category. We talked about it last week. God does not want to strengthen you and I in our physical bodies so that we look like, as I said, some big, you know, bulky athlete. And by the way, if you ever wondered about Samson, Samson was a skinny, scrawny, knucklehead brother that had no physical strength in himself. The thing that he had is the thing that God says we must have, and that's the third person, in order for us to be powerful enough to do exploits for God. Are you guys with me? So in our little children's books, they got Samson with these big old muscles. That's the outer man. It's the inner man that God strengthens with all might so that people do not see your strength physically. I might also say they do not see your strength psychologically. In other words, they don't see your strength by virtue of your human temperament and natural deportment. You might be naturally cool. Let me just use that word. I like the word cool. You might be naturally cool. You might be naturally uh, uh, tempered in a way that when 
struggles and challenges occur, you know, you don't go off half cocked. You don't fall apart. You don't make a mess. You don't make a scene. You're pretty balanced, even killed. And people might call that strength. But you could have that and be lost. You could have that and not know God. That's not what we're talking about when we talk about spiritual maturity or strength. So you're not going to see spiritual maturity or strength in a believer in those ways. You might see a believer who on a physical level is fairly um, easy to shake. When circumstances occur in their life because of their upbringing or because of their DNA or what have you, they may seem... Uh, pliable or docile. They may, be, they may seem to be somebody that can be a pushover. But if you penetrate past what you see and think about how they behave in their inner man around a trial, you might meet a mature person. Am I making some sense? So you might meet a believer who just has one of those crazy, goofy deportments, right? Kind of just goofy. But they have such a powerful no factor in their spirit that when trials come, you see their strength in restraining from succumbing to certain evils that others of us that might be puffed up with our knowledge would collapse under. Are you hearing what I'm saying? In other words, spiritual characteristics and spiritual virtues cannot be seen just in how a person carries himself. They could be tossed to and fro in the area of morals and ethics. And while the other person is shaking here and there and yonder and is as fickle as you and I might think, when they are confronted with a particular trial where they know clearly that this is contrary to God's will, they can stand strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. And you go, whoa, she stood when he fell. So you've got to look past external facade here. Strengthen with all might in the inner man. Are you guys with me? Next verse then, I want to work through this. Because we've looked at the strengthening, and we've looked at the power that is needed to be employed by the Spirit of God to strengthen us in our inner man. Now I want you to see the aim and objective of this strengthening. Verse 17, pull up verse 17. This is going to be the challenging part for us at the moment, but it's going to be a clarifying point. Not just a challenging point, but a clarifying point. So then the apostle says that he is praying that God would grant them according to the riches of his grace, that they would be strengthened by the power of God um, to become strong by the power of God and the spirit of God in order that Christ might dwell in their hearts by faith. Do you see that? All that I said in the previous verses for one thing, that Christ might be able to make his home in your heart. This is profound. All that I just stated earlier is for one thing, that the heart might be made available for Christ to live and dwell and have his way. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. So, verse 16 is the predicate of verse 17, right? Verse 17 says, we need Christ to what? What's the word? Dwell. You know what that word literally is in the Greek? To make himself I want you to get this now. At home. That's literally what it means. It's a complex verb. Oikos is our word for house. Oikodomeo means to build up. Kata oikos means to settle down as if he is at home. So I want you to work with me because this is where we ended up last week, right here. Paul realizes that for the believer to be able to enter into all that God has for them, Christ must be firmly 
established as the one who dwells in their heart and has his way in their soul. In order for that to happen, God must do what verse 16 implies. The inference to take away from this is that in order for Christ to dwell, we need the Spirit of God. We need the Spirit of God. Does that follow? In order for Christ to dwell in our hearts, to remain in our hearts, to abide in our hearts, to settle down in our hearts as his home, which is the same as Christ in you, the hope of glory, you need the Spirit of God to do what verse 16 says he will do in order for Christ to have his home in your life. Otherwise, he won't. I take from verses 16 and 17 this. If left to myself or left to this evil world, this sinful society, that parallel world I talked about that we don't see called the dimension of demons and devils and hell, left to that world, my sinfulness and this carnal secular world that I live in, none of those three would make room for Christ to dwell in my heart. How many understand what I'm talking about? Okay, so, so what's implied in verse 16 and 17 is a battle. What's implied in verse 16 and 17 is a battle. That's why you and I are headed to chapter 6. In order for Christ to dwell in your hearts, he has to have a power base that's working residently in you to fight against everything else that wants the throne of your heart. Does that make sense? Right. So now, just for those of you who are serious about tracking with me, we're going somewhere. The heart is not the cardiovascular muscle in the middle of your chest. The heart is the same as the inner man in verse 16, which means the essence of your being. That is your soul, the true you, the thing that indexes itself as being authentic autonomously different and distinct from every other creature in the universe, the me. The me, which is different than you and all the other seven, eight billion people on planet Earth that God has made. Am I making some sense? And the real me, not the superficial me, not the external me, not the me of my profession, not the me of my reputation, not the me of my external deeds. I'm talking about the real me, the core me, the essence of me, that when this body drops, the real me will still be there. So the Bible speaks of the heart because the heart is in the center of the physical body and the heart is a major muscle that helps determine the movement of the body. It's not the exclusive muscle, it's a major muscle, right? When that silent servant stops, everything stops, right? On this side of eternity. But this silent servant also needs the brain in order to collaborate with it in order for the body to do what it does, right? The brain then is the spirit of the living God, synonymously. We need the Spirit of God to help us think right. The Spirit of God must have his way in our heart in order for us to do right. The seed of our being is our heart, right? As a man thinks in his heart, so is he, right? Out of the abundance of the heart does the mouth speak, right? Man believeth with the heart, makes confession with the mouth, right? So the heart then becomes the real essence of our being that the Spirit of God has to get a hold of and, a, and situate Christ on the throne. Situate Christ on the throne of the heart. So now as we get ready to go into this next verse and work it through, the only thing I want you to do is realize that you need the third person. You need him. You need him not only to bring Christ to you in the proclamation of the gospel and the teaching of the word of God, but for him to really and truly have authority over your life in your soul. You need the spirit of God. And you need the Spirit of God not only before your conversion, but after your conversion. So now work with me for a moment and see if this is true before we move forward. 
if the Spirit of God doesn't sustain an authoritative presence of Christ in my life, I will go carnal. I will not sustain a continued, unending thinking about or having an affection towards or a desire to serve the true and the living God. And the love of Christ will not have its place in my thinking. And my priorities will be altogether about me. If Christ doesn't dwell in my heart in an authoritative way to dictate or mitigate my choices. Dictate my choices? Mitigate my choices. Dictate my choices. This is what you should do. Mitigate my choices. I'm not going to let you do that. Thank you, Lord, that you don't let me do that. So are you with me right now? Are you, are you with me right now? So now what this sounds like is a big word and the first letter is D. Who knows what I'm talking about? What's the word? Dependence. Dependence. What it sounds like is the believer must be constantly dependent upon God to do what God said he would do in the matters of growing him up. Are y'all with me? Right. And, and where you and I lose that conscious awareness that the thing that he has called you and I to is dependence, that's where you're going to get in trouble. When you and I are not depending upon God to remain faithful to his word, to bring to pass his promises in our life, we wake up by ourselves. And when we wake up by ourselves and sustain a long period of by ourselvesness, we make wrong choices. I'll use one example. This is in 2 Kings, 2 Chronicles around uh, chapter 31, 32, and this has to do with Hezekiah, a son of David, a son of the Lord Jesus. He was a king, and he had did great work for the Lord. Hezekiah had done an awful good for the kingdom of God, but he woke up one day proud. He's a believer now. Some of you guys can learn some of this on Sunday. Believers can make a mess of it. He woke up one day proud because he was the son of David, knowing that he was in the line of the Messiah, and he was operating out of the authority of his kingship, and he had served the Lord for many, many decades. He just woke up one day with his head on backwards. Have you ever done that? Watch this. And in his pride, he allowed the Babylonians to come in and see the glories of the kingdom. In his pride. I know on that day, he did not wake up saying, Lord, have your way. I know that. And guess what the text said? In three words, God left him. I want you to get what I'm saying. God left. So when you go and search this out, because you should, you should be hungry enough to want to find that text because that text is what we would call the pointer passage to our study tonight. It's the pointer passage to our study. It's the Old Testament text affirming what we're talking about tonight. If God leaves us, we're in trouble. Did you hear what I just said? Right, just in case some of you are uh, falling prey to a false argument against what I'm talking about, the necessity of a sustained presence of the Spirit of God to maintain the centrality of Christ in my life, that somehow if you think just because you're born again, it's a given, or assume that being born again, it does not require the present work of the Spirit of God to sustain your born againness by the presence of Christ in your heart, what God will often do is just back up a little bit and let you know, though even born again, you have no strength to do the right thing or think the right thing without God. Even born again. Even born again. Well, that's only logical. If God saved us and gave us the kind of strength that we could intrinsically do it by ourselves, we could glory in our own works. I'll say that again just for the record. When he makes you and our newborn babes in Christ, he doesn't walk away from us having thought that now they can get the job done on their own. Even the true believer will fall flat on his face without the grace of God. So flat on your face without God, you, are sw you will swear you're lost. Because of the power vacuum. It 
is ultimately vulnerable and, 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 and alarming when you discover you don't have any power to even think right, let alone do right. Isn't it alarming when you go, oh, I can't even sustain a right thought right now. Whoa, these cravings in my nature are so contrary to the will of God. I see it, but I can't do anything about it. Whoa. And for those of you who are really hungering and thirsting for righteousness, understand that there is a place for that experience in the redemptive purposes of God. But don't presume upon it. Don't presume upon it. Because too many believers presume upon, I'm so toe up, can't do nothing about it, I'm going to just dwell in my toe upness. That's not the point. That's not the point. The point is, somewhere down the line, you left off depending upon God. Like Hezekiah did. And to whom much is given, much is what? And as Hezekiah was a king, are we kings? As Hezekiah ruling in God's kingdom, do we rule? Yes, we do. And then when we act like our rule and our position is something that's intrinsic to our nature, doesn't the third person, the resident Lord, have a right to back up and let us fall? After all, he's going to pick us up again, isn't he? That's what I mean. Does that work? That's what I mean. So go back to our text and let's work this through. This is crazy. So I know that I'll need another week, even though we're not going to be here next week, to get into verse 18. So I'm going to just touch on verse 17 a little bit today. So we need strength by the Spirit of God to operate in the inner man in order that Christ might have his way in our life, be home in our life, be home in our hearts, and he must be home in our hearts by what? He must be home in our hearts by what? By faith. Okay, so even there, you need to capture that. You need to make sure that you don't let that get away from you. Don't let faith become a throwaway term. Don't let faith become a throwaway term. Like being born again is a throwaway term today. I'm born again. Well, maybe, maybe not. I'm saved. Well, maybe, maybe not. Don't let faith be a throwaway term. Understand faith in all of its practical dimensions because it is an adjective or a noun that is used as a qualifier for virtually everything you experience in God. By faith, by faith, by faith, by faith. If you don't believe me, just start with Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, and go to, through verse 36, and virtually every verse says, by faith, by faith, by faith, by faith, by faith, by faith, by faith. And it only makes sense to those of you who have been taught the principle of faith and its virtues and its qualities here at Grace. Without it, you can't please God. If God doesn't do what he does to establish Christ on the throne of our hearts by faith, then whatever is taking place in our life won't be pleasing to God. Because the thing that pleases God is what? Are you guys with me so far? Stay right there. So if God is only pleased by faith, whatever God gives to me, whatever God works through me or works in me, better be done by what? Otherwise, God will not accept it. The antithesis of faith is what? The antithesis of faith is what? Works. The antithesis, I know y'all grew up in public schools. The antithesis of faith is works. And by works, no man shall be justified in the sight of God. You are saved through grace by faith. You are kept by faith through the power of God. It's a faith paradigm, a faith principle, a faith basis by which you and God enjoy each other. Faith means you didn't have anything to do with how you got where you were. And I'm still not actually explaining the contents and characteristics of faith. I'm explaining the nature of faith relative to you. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but by his mercy hath he saved us, right? 
So when we say that by faith these things are done, we're saying by the gospel. We're saying that it's done by the power of God, accomplished for us because of Christ and through Christ. Because faith is a synonym for the gospel. Is that right? Right. So the gospel has to work in my life as the power of God to sustain Christ in my heart by the spirit of God. Does that make some sense, ladies and gentlemen? So now watch this. If Christ is going to dwell in my heart, the gospel has to do it by his spirit. If Christ is going to rule in my heart, the gospel has to do it by his spirit. It has to be the power of the gospel sustaining Christ in my heart. Am I making some sense? So here's a practical takeaway before we go to the next part. You may not know it when you hear the gospel and all of the elements that constitutes the gospel, which is the person and work of Christ. But every time you hear the gospel, what you are hearing is that means by which God sustains Christ on the throne of your heart. You may not be aware of it when it's happening, but what's happening when the gospel is preached is that Christ is being retained on your heart as supreme and central and essential and glorious. Let me put it another way. When you are not hearing the gospel, it's very possible that you don't even perceive when Christ is not on the throne of your heart. Raise your hand if you understand what I'm talking about. It's a mystery, isn't it, when the gospel of the glory of God, of Christ, is preached and you discover you still love him. You discover that. Now, if you don't discover it because you've been walking in profound unity and communion with them, that's cool, too. You came in with a clear cognitive awareness of Christ seated on the throne of your heart. You already had fellowship with him. And so when Pastor Jesse is preaching or teaching or my brothers are expounding the gospel, your soul says yes to what you know is already occurring in your soul. Either way, you never take the gospel for granted. You never take the gospel for granted. Every time the gospel is preached, allow your heart and soul to sit under that gospel to make sure that you have not adulterated yourself against God so that it does not become the spirit of jealousy that causes the thigh to swell and the belly to rot because we've committed spiritual idolatry against God. You guys understand what I just said? Yes, no. Numbers chapter 5, 6 is plainly laid out. The woman that committed adultery against her husband, and it was not made known to her husband, yet her husband was really struggling with the implications of her infidelity. He didn't know how to determine it, and you don't have a right to judge and, and condemn until you know the things, but there's a test that you can give under the Old Testament system to determine whether or not she had cheated on him. That test was a glass of water sanctified by the priest. Had a few other elements in it too, by the way. And they gave her an opportunity to confess. And if she said, no, I never slept with anyone, I didn't do anything wrong, and yet she had, once she drank the bitter waters that causes the curse, her leg would rot, her belly would swell, and everyone in Israel would know that what was a secret now is made public. Do you guys get that? Now, here is the corresponding gospel promise. When a man or woman has changed teams, as we talked about last Sunday, and try to keep the same uniform on, when the gospel is preached, they hate it. It becomes foreign to them. They don't like it because they position themselves to make the bitter element of the gospel something that is incongruent to their sinful practice. Did you guys hear what I just stated? When we're walking right with God in terms of dependence and trust upon him, when the gospel comes, even when it hurts, it's sweet. Did you hear what I just stated? Even when it hurts, it's sweet. And that affirms the fact that we have not traded Christ in for carnal lovers. So where we are in our second point is that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, by the gospel, by the power of the gospel, in order that you being what? Rooted and grounded. Now, that's the second objective of verse 16. 
The first objective, Christ is in the house as Lord of the house. He sits on the throne in the house. He gets to check every room in the house, deal with every room in the house, every cabinet in the house, every corner in the house, because he's Lord of the house. And if he has his way, two things is going to happen when he's running the house. He's going to build you up. And he's going to root you. Did you get what I just stated? If Christ gets to dwell in your house, he's going to fix that raggedy house up. If Christ gets to dwell in your house, he's going to fix that raggedy house up. The two analogies in those two verbs, those are what are called perfect verb forms right there. Those participles, they're in the perfect verb. He's going to perfectly build you up. He's going to perfectly root you and ground you. One is architectural. The other one is agricultural. The one is a building built up. Do you see it? The other one is a tree. Root it. Both of those are analogies of the believer, are they not? We are a spiritual house and we are trees of righteousness. Both of them correspond to the final vision of the book of Revelation. The new Jerusalem and the trees of life through which the river of the water of life flow. God's always conflating these two visions with us. Trees, houses, trees, houses. House for him to dwell in trees for him to enjoy the fruit I am the true vine you are the branches my father is the husbandman every branch in me that brings forth fruit he purges it that it might bring forth more fruit every branch that does not bear fruit he cuts it off you guys with me you see how the Bible is so coherent and repetitive in order to build what are called standing analogies for you and me. God wants to build us up as a house and God wants to also root us as a tree. Why? Because there's an ontological connection between God, Christ, and us. Blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. We already have seen Ephesians 2.20. We already have seen 1 Peter chapter 2.5. And you are built up a spiritual house unto God, a habitation of God through the Spirit. God's building a house. He's growing a tree. Is that right? He's building a house. He's growing a tree. And what's radical about what I'm talking about, it all is a result of the second and third person dwelling there. The second person is there only because of the third person. Second person is there only because of the third person. Third person is there only because of the first person. My father will send the comforter to you, comforter to you, and when the comforter, the Holy Ghost comes, the spirit of truth, he will take the things of mine and show them to you. Is that what it says? Well, I'm actually jumping ahead with that. I'm actually jumping ahead with that, but it's still rich because what I've just stated is verse 16 is a dependency need rooted in a process that God affirms, and that is the work of the Spirit of God. Verse 17 underscores the objective of verse 16, and that is the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ dwelling, situated and ruling in our house in order to build us up and to root and ground us, right? Do you guys see that? God is making a house out of you. He's strengthening you, becoming a house. You become a house for him, a dwelling place for him. He's making you a tree of righteousness in order that you might be productive for his glory, his own satisfaction, and the satisfaction of others who eat the fruit off your tree. And guess what? God gets all the glory because you didn't do anything but be. Is that true? If I were to drive home the passive verbs here, you're just there. Isn't that good? Just there. So verse 17 is for Christ to make his home in your heart by the gospel. There's another word there that you have to see before we move to verse 18 and shut it down. In order that Christ might dwell in your hearts by faith, that you being rooted, that's the tree, and grounded, that's the house, in what? So get that. In the Greek construction, all of those words are different. They're positioned differently. 
It doesn't matter. I get, I, get, I get the King James. I get the ESV. I get the others. They put the word love there last in order to emphasize the basis of the relationship. The basis of the relationship. So watch this. The word love is there as the basis of the relationship. It's the basis for which God does what he does in you. And it's the basis for which you, by his grace, are allowing him to do it. Are y'all following what I just stated? Right. So, so I don't want you to miss faith. Instrumentally, it's the gospel and all of the things that the gospel inherently promises and employs in our life. Beautiful. But I definitely want you to get love. Because what is being implied by love is a voluntary, mutual relationship between God and the believer on the grounds of God seeing something beautiful in the believer and the believer seeing something beautiful in God. Love is always a subject-object relationship where both see something beautiful in the other. How many of you guys enjoying what I'm saying? So I, I need you to get this because actually we haven't even actually entered into the door of what the other verses are saying, but we can't if we don't get this. So I know in our present Western culture, we just have worn the word love out. But that's all right. It, it knows how to resurrect its own self. So when we use the term love in this context, here's what I want you to get. The revelation of the triune God effectually accomplishing what his nature is designed to do. Love then for us is God being God and therefore sharing the beauties and splendors of themselves with us. How many of you guys followed me with that? I love it. So some of y'all got lost. Love is always a subject-object relationship. And therefore, because God is love, 1 John chapter 4, around verse 18, it intrinsically underscores a community of persons. If you say this individual is a lovely individual, what you are stating about that person is some type of experiential dynamic that corresponded between him and others by which that adjective love can be affirmed. You will not say someone is lovely if all that takes place is a self-declared love that, deter that determinates on themselves on an individual level. You with me so far? Let me say this again. If one person is representing himself so that there is no subject-object relationship and he calls himself lovely, that's not love, that's narcissism. You guys got that? Yeah. Right. And you know, we basically are ready to call John George. For those of you who don't know John George, it's a facility right up the hill off of 150th Avenue that deal with people who are a little bit tweaked with delusions of grandeur. Love is always, in a biblical context, the consequence of community. Always. Can I talk to you for a few more minutes? That's why my sister Gidry was asking me the question as we were coming in. So what's the first promise in the Bible and 
She finally said Genesis 3.15, Genesis 3.16, that God had told the woman that her seed would uh, be bruised by the head of the serpent, but he would crush her head. We call that the first evangelical promise. It's called the proto-evangel. That's the first evangelical promise. But we got three chapters that, to go from Genesis 1.1 1, 1 to Genesis 3.16, right? 3.15. So are there any promises in between Genesis 1.1 1, 1 and Genesis 3.15? Of course there are. Here's the first glorious promise. Are you ready? Love expressed by the triune God, affecting itself upon a creature that he has determined to make in his own image in order to enter into communion with that God. Did you get that? Let us make men in our own image and in our own likeness so that they can have dominion and experience what we have because we by nature are love. And the very fact that God would give that directive to man demonstrates that he loves man. But in order for man to actually fulfill his loveliness, he has to see God as lovely. Did you hear what I just stated? In order for man to fulfill his loveliness, he has to see God as lovely because God is love. Now, love is not God, but God is love. We're not going to jack it up tonight. What we're going to do is say that love, by definition, is always a subject-object relationship where the two parties see something that's affectionately and delightfully attractive in the other. Which is actually... An amazing concept when we think about God loving sinners. But the only way that equation works is the second person. Right? The only way that equation works is the second person. This is why he must dwell in our hearts. Because our thoughts about God and love for God and God's love for us, apart from Christ is absurd. God cannot love us apart from Christ. There's nothing lovely in us. Mirror, mirror on the wall. Who's the fairest of them all? And the mirror says, the Lord Jesus Christ. So what the text is actually teaching is that the sustained relationship between God and his unmeasurable gift of Christ being accomplished in our life is based upon his immutable, unchanging love for us. And it's based upon a resident love in us for God. Did you guys hear what I just stated? So if you and I are becoming rooted and we are becoming grounded. It's because of the sustained presence of the love of God in our heart, fueling our faith. Right? You guys have been under my teaching a long time, and I repeat things over and over and over until they become catechized in your life. Faith works by what? And no other way. If you have a faith divorced from love, you don't have biblical faith. You don't have the faith of God's elect. You don't have saving faith. You don't have the faith that pleases God. See, the faith that pleases God is rooted in love. That's what makes God so happy with us. When we can trust God in spite of what we see. Do you get that? Because the fuel of faith is love. That's right. Is that true? The fuel of it. So when my faith is diminishing, I know what else is diminishing. What? You with me? Right. So, 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 so God supplies his love by his spirit, which produces faith in us that allows us to see the glories of God in Christ and all that he's done for us that keeps us, that causes us to persevere while God is rooting us and God is grounding us, while he's building us up a spiritual house, while he's making us strong trees of righteousness. What's sustaining us is a mutual love of God towards us and us towards God. Is this good? So in your outline, what I have is a second point called the outward relationship. Do you see it? Do you see it? Yeah. And then the final one is the upward what? Consummation. 
So I actually have a whole lot more between where we are now in our present uh, uh, first point, dealing with our strengthening. The first point is entitled what? Can you pull that up? What is our first point? The point number one, point number one, point number one. Point, point number one. Is that in your PowerPoint? No, oh, should be a point number one. What is the point number one? There it is. The strengthening of the inward revelation. That's point number one. That's what we're talking about right now. Right? The strengthening of the inward revelation. This is what I want you to go home appreciating as we shut it down. That the inward re uh, revelation of God in Christ is being sustained in our hearts by this process we're talking about. Right? All that we're talking about is a sustaining of the revelation of Christ in our heart. I can't love a God I don't know. I can't love a God I can't comprehend. God cannot be lovely to me apart from Christ. Because apart from Christ, all God is is a consuming fire. Am I making some sense? Right. So in Christ, God is love. God is glorious. God is righteous. Herein is the love of God manifested. That Christ died for our sins and became a propitiation for us. That's love manifested in a way in which a sinner like me can enjoy God. I can't enjoy God in the splendor of his holiness apart from Christ. The second person must be there to filter me into God's holiness. Because I know myself. So the inward revelation of Christ is actually God's love to you. Does that make sense? He's constantly flooding your heart with revelations of Christ. It's because he loves you enough in order that you might respond to him in love through Christ to sustain that relationship, to grow you up, to grow you. Now, this is crazy, but he's growing you up in order that you might enter into something. You guys with me so far? All right, I do want to shut it down, but I'm just going to state it in verse 18 and verse 19, and week after next, we're going to come back here before we go to point two, the outward relationship. So what I had said earlier in our opening study was this. God has purposed to reveal his glory to us in a saving, sanctifying, consummating way through a fundamental process that has to do with the collective gathering of the saints. Did I say that at the opening of the study? In other words, he has never ever communicated himself to you by himself to you apart from someone else. God has never ever communicated himself to you by himself apart from someone else. And God has not determined as a stewardship or as an economy to strengthen and build up a believer anywhere, anywhere in the world, at any time in the world, apart from a community. All through the Bible has been a community. Even in the days when he destroyed the whole world with the exception of Noah and his family, at least his family was a community of believers. So who was the preacher in that family? According to Peter, it was Noah. According to the Hebrew writer, Noah was the one receiving revelation from God to speak into the lives of his wife and his son-in-laws and his daughters and it sustained them for 120 years while they went through hell and they built the ark of which the whole world mocked until the day that something happened that had never ever happened before and that is raindrops? Whoa! And for 120 years, the antagonism the antipathy, the hatred, the vandalism of the ark, the persecution, the ignominy, and the scorn that they went through, they endured because of a love that sustained their faith. And the presence of the Spirit of God on the grounds of grace, because Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord while the rest of the people were trying to get in by their own good works. And they missed out on the exclusivity of the gospel represented in the ark. Noah preached to his family until God saved them. Because that was the community that the, sec the third person resided in. Didn't he? The third person was hovering over, dwelling in, protecting, sustaining one family 
while the whole world was in violence and tumult and conflict and hatred towards God. One family, one, can you imagine that? One family made it through the flood. And that one family became the seed to the whole human race. So I'm just actually giving you just, the door is opening just a little bit into the revelation. Just a little bit into the revelation. Just using history into the revelation. What was going on in Noah's head to make it for 120 years in a culture where there was nothing that even remotely comported with or agreed with anything that God was saying or that they were doing? What was keeping Noah? Revelations of God's glory in Christ. Yeah. That's what was keeping Brother Noah. You can read it for yourself. Hebrews and Peter makes it clear. His family was doing exactly what we're doing as a family. Sitting under the preaching and the teaching of the gospel, letting it shape our heart, letting it prioritize our life, let it determine for us how we act and where we go and what we do and what we say and how it impacts us on an evangelical level, an apologetic level, a, a family level, a domestic level. You guys understand what I'm saying? They were going through exactly what we're going through. And God blessed them with such insights as described in verse 18 and 19. I'm just going to read it, then we're going to come back in two weeks. He says, we're praying that you're strengthened with all might in the inner man by the spirit in order that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith so that you, having been rooted and grounded, that's the end result of Christ's ruling, in love, may be able to comprehend. Do you see that? There is a necessity to comprehend something that cannot take place until we're rooted and grounded. So whatever it is that God wants us to comprehend is so big that it cannot be experienced until we're rooted. Do you guys see that? All of this is in order that you may be able to comprehend. Now here's the word I want you to get with the word comprehend. Bad, very bad word. Too sterile. Too pedantic. Too, too scholastic. Here's the word I want you to get. That you may be eagerly committed to grasping what God has for you. That you may be eagerly committed to grasping and laying hold of what God has for you. So whatever he has for us after this statement is only secure if we eagerly are grasping for it, taking hold of it as most precious. You guys with me so far? Get a chance to come back and explain that. The attitude behind that statement in that particular participle is this. When God's through rooting and grounding you, your hunger for his glory will be so massive that at the slightest opportunity for a deeper walk with Christ, you are there. To him that hath, more shall be given. So just so I can get you home, I can't even tell you what these next verses actually mean in terms of that. But I know I've been humbled by them because I'm thinking on a, just on a social and a historical and a contemporary level, I'm going, these words were uttered some 2,000 years ago. And is it possible that saints from the time that they were uttered entered into these promises on this side of glory? And is it possible that entering into these promises on this side of glory has something to do with sustaining the gospel against all assaults 
from generation to generation to generation to generation to generation to even get it to us. So that at this present time, the same promises that were given to them of which they had to lay hold of by faith, which they could not do without the spirit of God or Christ dwelling in the heart over against persecution and martyrdom and hostility and uh, ostracization and, and being kicked out of cities and burned at the stake and all of the other stuff that the saints had to suffer for the gospel's sake. Whatever it was that God gave to them, they accomplished it through verses 16 and 18 to pass it on. And here's the reason I say it. Because the text demands that I understand the inclusiveness of them with me in that revelation. So whatever revelations God has for me in this generation, in this promise, is a culmination of what he said to them and did with them and through them generations back. Am I making some sense? And somehow, if we get it, it gets passed on. If we get it. Now, somebody's going to get it. It may not be us, but somebody's going to get it. But I want it to be me. I want to pass it on. I want people to see his glory. His glory. My kids, my grandkids, my great-grandkids. Whatever that glory is, I want them to have the benefit of it. Don't you? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. So, Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for what is implied in the text. And quite frankly, you have explicitly laid it out through your son that there are glories in Christ that the Spirit has purposed to reveal to us that we do not yet comprehend or see. And we pray that over the next weeks and months and years, as we are seeking to grow up in you and mature in you, that you would qualify us to seize and take hold of these revelations as that inheritance by which we are uh, built up and made to be partaker of all those that are sanctified in Christ. This is what we're asking for. And we're asking for this for us and our children and our children's children and our children's children's children. And we ask for traveling mercies as we go our way now. Bless us to just think this stuff through and not let the birds of the air come down and eat the sea. These are great and precious promises. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys.